Todo el mundo. Hello, I'm Nipper Reed. And I'm Phil Wolf. So, settle down, have a nice cup of tea, and enjoy the Venomous Exchange Radio Podcast. Crumpets, Nipper. I want the crumpets. Well, as you've been such an extraordinarily good boy. And we're on. Hello, everyone in the internets. My name is Phil Wolf, and tonight I'm joined with my cohort of sorts, Mr. Nipper Reed. Hello, everybody. And this would be the Venom Exchange Radio episode numero dos. Splendid. How you been, fella? What's been going on? Ah, uh, same old, same old, man. Snakes, snakes, and more snakes. The occasional lizard. I, uh, I recently got inspected by uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. We have an annual inspection for the venomous stuff. Yeah. So that was 48 hours of tireless uh, scrubbing, cleaning, organizing, relabeling. And uh, naturally, I passed with flying colors, which is always uh, a sigh of relief. And uh, my rooms never looked cleaner. <laughs> oh, that is, it's so different. You live in an apartment block, don't you? Yeah. I mean, so technically, it's uh, my bank of my bank building is essentially townhomes. Um, it's it's four homes together in one building. There's an upstairs and a downstairs. They're all cookie cutters of one another. And then surrounded by my one building is all apartments. So technically, it is an apartment, but it is an up and a down. And I have both. Okay, because in the UK, you can't get a DWA license, which is what we need to keep venomous if you live in a multi-occupancy block really yeah you've got to have your own premises interesting yeah the uh we have uh because all the buildings are hurricane proof to the best of their ability you know uh it's all concrete block and then they have firewalls that extend all the way through the attic so in theory there is a wall that goes between my home and my neighbor's home that goes all the way to the ceiling um there was, however, a story of uh, my roommate before I lived with him. He had a, um, oh, now I can't remember the name of the damn thing. Uh, the cave rat snake. The uh, Wow, totally drawn a blank, and now I feel like a moron. Ridley Eye? Ridley Eye, thank you, thank you. you had, good good he job, had, on Yeah, I know, right? So he had a Ridley Eye get loose, and he mm. thought it was gone forever, and we never found it, and the neighbor four doors down had found it in her kitchen oh. so uh and and she called animal control and animal control came and they're like this is not native to florida you know i don't know where this must have came from and i didn't even none of us knew this until years later shit because my neighbors they have no idea that i keep snakes yeah, right and uh and and she, my neighbor was like yeah this one time there was this giant snake in my in my house and it was brown with a white face and it had these crazy stripes and i was just like oh, oh, oh. so I've had the same thing. I, I live in a detached property. I've got space around me. And my snake's all in a building in the garden. Mm -hmm. But I was doing some repairs and I had the doors off the building. And uh, something must have got out. And unfortunately, it was rear fang as well. And uh, my neighbour, who doesn't like snakes at all, uh, called me over and said in an extremely dischuffed voice, is this one of yours? And curled up around the handle of his uh, garden gate was a little uh, cat snake. Beautiful little thing. <laughs> so, but that, that had survived out in the open for about a week in UK climbs, and it was absolutely wow. fine. Yeah. Nice, nice. I got Lisa. a massive bollocking from my missus for that, which uh, I'm probably yeah. still, still paying for. Yeah. But, but on the bright side, at least both of our stories, the animal was recovered. So that's This is true. This that's is true. the best part about it, you know, and yeah. and I have a uh, knock on wood. I have not yet had a uh, a snake escape from my room. So that must be a testament to uh, my rigid protocol. <coughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, I have not bought any snakes this week. But I you have, did get some geckos, right? I have bought more geckos. It's My man. Ah, oh, mate, it's become an obsessional. It's terrible. <laughs> and uh, certain people who share my name has been posting pictures of Shemulian geckos today on various sites. Nice. I'm so tempted. They're three and a half grand a pair. But Oof. Nice. 
so cool. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. I know there's been a lot of uh, a lot of unique geckos floating around Instagram and such because I'm getting it from friends. They're like, hey, man, what is this? I'm having a hard time Googling it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the big Euro shows next month at the beginning of next month. So uh, I'm sort of trying to put in some orders for that as well. So uh, nice. a, few bar- a few barking geckos, a little bit of Oijira, spend some dollars. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Very, very cool, man. Well, tonight we have, actually, this will be our first ever guest on the Venom Exchange Radio. Um, oh. Some of you know him as the Club King. Others may know him by his real name, Mr. Kyle Vargas. Uh, Kyle is one of the, if not the leading keeper, breeder, and field worker of montane rattlesnakes, rock rattlesnakes, and their kin. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Kyle, the Club King. You there, sir? I am here. I am here. Good evening. Welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, uh, we're we're stoked to have you on, and we're stoked to have you as our first live human guest. Um, For those of you listening, uh, Kyle is actually doing maintenance on his baby rack, so you can hear some clicking and some scooping and maybe even a rattle from here and there. But, uh, But yeah, man. Nipper and I are, I don't want to speak for Nipper, but we're huge fans of your work. Uh, we fangirl frequently on your photography. Oh, mate, 100%. I, it, it, almost every day on Instagram, I keep wanting to write him messages, but I don't want him to think I'm stalking him or something like that. It's, <laughs> it's just sensational. Some of your photographs, man. They, I mean, I take a lot of photographs, but yours are killer. Just, oh. I appreciate and, it. I really do. Uh, I spend uh, I spend a lot of time doing it, so it's it's good to hear, it's good to hear that they're they're at least halfway decent. Oh mate, they're, they're more than halfway decent, and it's the species as well. I mean, for, for a European to be seeing some of the stuff that you're posting on such a regular basis, it's outstanding. Right, and I mean the animals. It's kind of hard to take a bad picture of of some of the snakes that I have, you know. This yeah, is very true. Um, and we've just had a lovely virtual tour before we started of uh, Carl's setup. And, you know, unfortunately you can't see it, but trust me, it is sort of snake room life goals. It is outstanding. It's crisp. It's, yeah. uh, it might even rival Scott's and Ty's snake room, which it, it is might. currently the best snake room I've seen. But this has got to be challenging it. It's, uh, it's the shears. I'm loving it. You know, what I think too is the uh, just to go back to his photos for a minute. The when I look at the photos on Instagram, uh, so one of my favorite things with with her photos is the animal in the foreground and the natural habitat in the in the background, right? And Kyle has those pictures, but when he zooms in on one specific specimen, there are so many times when I'm literally questioning myself, is that in the field or is that in captivity? Because yeah. his enclosures are so spot on and tip top that you honestly, you can't tell the difference. It's, it's awesome. It is it's quality. And the cynic in me, when I see a shot, shot as good as some of those, he's got, oh, he's done that inside. He's had that snake in the fridge for about 20 minutes. And he's <laughs> a little thing. <laughs> I know how difficult it is to fil- uh, to film uh, vipers in you know in situ. You've yeah. got wi- you've got wind. You've got the snake doing threat postures. You've got insects that just as you're about to take your classic shot, a fly will land on its head. You've got vegetation that gets in the way and ruins your, your really good shot. Oh yeah. Um, I mean these shots are just outstanding. I do yeah. hate him. I hate him for it. To be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> well, yeah. I I appreciate that. I take that. <laughs> Yeah, and it's what's crazy is like we we all hold you know Ty and Scott's room to the standard, right? In terms of laboratory grade cleanliness, efficiency, safety, all of that stuff. And then you look at Kyle's room, and it has it's not so uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It has a, a warmer feel to it's, it. It's not clinical. It's right. just right. beautifully set up. It's yeah. tidy. It's crisp. And there's probably it's, double the animals too. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Yeah, it's uh, it's doing wonders for my OCD. It looks absolutely immaculate. It's I have, 
pretty bad OCD. So oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm I'm CDO. That's the letters in the right order. But um, <laughs> just to see, I mean, with, with a collection that big, to see it maintain that well is not the norm. You know, normally with big collections, stuff starts dropping off the end. It's not as tight as it should be. You know, maintenance right. is not done as regularly. That just looks amazing. I appreciate it. It takes it takes a lot of time. I mean, I, I will say that, um, but it's it's worth it. You know, not only for me, but I feel like for the animals. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. Right. My first question. Our first question is an obvious question, but we need to ask it. Why did you get into venomous? Why aren't you keeping corn snakes? Uh, so I guess it goes back to when I was a, a kid. I was eight years old um, and I found a rattlesnake outside and um, I caught it. I brought it home. I got in a lot of trouble for it. And uh, I guess that kind of that in, in itself kind of sparked my interest, you know. Um, what, whereabouts are you based for someone that's in Europe? We'll do what? Whereabouts are you from? Because you know, I'm so I'm, I'm from El Paso, Texas. You're from Texas, great. Yeah. And I, I grew up in uh, another place about four hours away called Midland, Texas, um, and that's where I actually found my first my first rattlesnake. And um, I kind of just I always kept reptiles, you know, as I was young, and I had a lot of lizards when I was growing up, um, you know, frogs, all that typical pet shop stuff. And um, when I was 15 years old. I actually ditched uh, <laughs> one of my classes, uh, freshman class, and um, me and my buddy decided we're just going to go hiking, man. We want to get outside and, and enjoy the day. And um, I went to go put my hand up on a, on a rock to pull myself up, and I felt, you know, something kind of squishy under it, you know, and it was, it was making a weird noise, and I thought, you know, what, what the hell is that? So I kind of took a different route and went up above it and looked down and it was a rock rattlesnake. Wow. Amazing. So, yeah. And I mean, I didn't know a single thing about herping. I, you know, I had never done it really before. I, you know, I would go out and kind of try to catch lizards and stuff like that. But I had no idea that you could really just go out and target snakes and find them and stuff. You know, I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, I didn't know that, that a rock rattlesnake was a species. So, yeah. I kind of thought I had discovered something new, you know, at the time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, holy smokes, man. I, I, you know, I've never seen anything like this on TV. You know, I've never, every time you see a rattlesnake, this is not it. Um, so basically, uh, I, I started going around to a bunch of different pet shops. And finally, somebody told me, you know, hey, this is a rock rattlesnake. And I looked them up online and it was over. I mean, it, it, I was hooked. You know, Sorry. I love it. I've always loved being outside, and um, for me to be able to be outside and have a goal, you know, yeah. to achieve every time I do it, it's like the perfect combination for me, and it keeps me going out there to this day, you know? Oh, yeah. Do you well, think, we, you, I was going to say, do you think you'd be the same if you lived somewhere, and you're going to have to help me out here, a state in America that doesn't have many rattlesnakes? Uh uh geez i don't know i, mean, I guess most of the northern states yeah uh, maine, <laughs> maine. Yeah. i don't know it's it's kind of hard to say um i i often think about stuff like that you know what what would i do without them you know what would my life path be had i not you know landed upon this you know yeah. but um i don't know I, I it's it's really really hard to say but i'm glad i didn't grow up in any of those places right right you know i feel like I really, I really feel like this is for me. I mean, this is what I'm good at. This is, you know, I've made a name for myself uh, somewhat, you know, um, in, in the hobby and especially with the species that I keep. And it was always a goal of mine, you know, when I first started and I realized, you know, that people were keeping these things and, you know, trying to breed them. And, uh, you know, back in the day when I started, um, well, I say back in the day, but, you know, 17 years ago, I mean, information wasn't out like it is today. You know, people weren't talking how they are today. People weren't really sharing the same kind of information. When you bred stuff, you were trying to keep it to yourself, you know, because you wanted to be that guy. Oh, yeah. Um, and so just now, you know, people are, even me, I'm, I'm guilty of that now. It took me a long time to figure stuff out and, and how to breed stuff and really get stuff going. Um, 
and I'm, I'm reluctant to share it with some people because I think, and it's, it's not in a, any kind of a, with malicious intent, but I think that a lot of people nowadays are missing out on, on the journey that it takes to get to places, you know, um, of course. you know, people are just given like handbooks on how to breed ball pythons and, and stuff like that. And now I don't mean any offense by this, but you know, a lot of people that shop in pet stores and, and things like that, they breed ball pythons now because they bought a book and right. you know, yeah. I, I, it just, it steals, it steals everything that I love about the process. I completely agree. You've got to remember I am ancient compared to both of you. Um, <laughs> although I look a lot younger than Phil because of his hedonistic lifestyle. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm pre-internet. So when I was trying to, when I first started out and when I first started herping and wanting to keep stuff, you couldn't just go online and get all the info you needed. You had to, this is unusual for people, you had to read a book about it. And yeah. there right. wasn't, a, you couldn't just, you know, go online and meet a hundred other people that were into the same thing. Right. You had to wait to a, a quarterly meeting of a local reptile society. And then you might meet somebody that also liked the same stuff as you and would go out herping. And you're absolutely right in what you're saying. Nowadays, somebody with zero knowledge or experience can go online, they can buy a phenomenally rare species, and the information is there all on it, at the, literally at the click of a finger. It's, yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the people that excel and have, um, I don't want to word it, kudos, the people that I look up to in the hobby are people that have done their own journey to get to where they are not just piggybacked off other people's mistakes. I mean, it's, it's great to share information and learn, but I think everyone should, everyone should have a journey. And I think that the, the keepers that have had a decent journey end up being long-term better keepers. Yeah, I agree. There we are. Yeah. And I mean, the same, you know, you heard that as you were growing up, you know, you, you respect things and you cherish things more that you pay for yourself, you know, as opposed to things that are given to you. And I mean, it's kind of the same, you know, with knowledge, because knowledge can be given also. And um, it's just, I, I'd, I'd personally rather figure things out myself, you know, and at the end, when I finally get there and I finally do it, you know, when those babies are finally born, I mean, man, there's just, it's hard to, it's hard to even say what feels better than that for me. You know, I mean, when oh, I, yeah. there are species, you know, and, and certain localities of species that, man, I've, I've tried to breed for like eight, nine years, you know, and then you, they finally do it. And it's like, I, I you know, I did it. I, I, I did it, man. That's amazing. So yeah. what did you think if you'd your first snake had been a Nerodia or a garter snake or something like that? Do you think you'd have been so dedicated and excited? Do you think it would have taken you down the same sort of route? Or do you think the fact that it is venomous, it is a little unusual, there is a, a danger element to it? So I will say that I, I've, I've never really viewed my keeping uh, venomous, you know, in that light i've never really done it to impress anybody or or for for anybody else's um enjoyment you know other than mine um there's a lot of species you know even venomous wise that i could keep that are much more impressive to you know the general public and, and get a lot more reactions you know than the stuff i keep i could keep rhino vipers you know or, or uh, king cobras and you know just wow people all over the internet and and i've done i've done stuff like that. I've kept king cobras and I've, you know, I've kept big pythons and uh, I used to have some big monitor lizards, you know, and I, I've, I've kind of dabbled in a pretty much everything. I used to breed king snakes really, really heavy. I mean, there was a time when I had probably 400 king snakes. Um, yeah, I was, I was breeding, wow. I was breeding gray banded king snakes, man, t tons of them, uh, milk snakes and just all kinds of stuff. I've done it all and nothing really just draws me in like the montane rattlesnakes do you know they're they really are difficult they really do require you know set parameters to be able to breed um especially you know certain species um but it's just it provides me with enough challenge and enough reward that it's 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 the perfect balance for me i think and have, have it, 
having kept a lot of, as you say, you've kept a lot of random stuff. Do you, are you feeling it's easier that now you're just keeping one style of species in terms of your husbandry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's impossible without, you know, ample space to be able to keep several different genre of, of snakes together in a room and be successful with them. You know, you can't keep uh, Bothraacus in the same room as you can, you know, uh, Aatrox. You just can't do it and, and be successful with them both. You could, but I mean, it'd take a lot. Right. You know, especially with the amount of snakes that I have. I mean, my, my collection fluctuates anywhere between 270 to 400 snakes at any given time throughout the year you know with babies that i have born and stuff that i've held back and haven't decided to move yet i mean it gets crazy that, so, that is that's is amazing yeah and it, it's just easier like you said and to answer your question yeah it's it's much easier you know they all they all like the same kind of uh food you know they all like to eat lizards that's what i'm feeding i'm actually feeding some lizards off right now um and they're they're easily available to me, you know the the lizards that I use to feed my animals. They're they're easily available to me uh, through a local guy here in town. Um, and if I kept any other species, I don't know that I would, you know, I wouldn't have availability to frogs. Maybe if I bred a species that were to like frogs. So again, I think it's just a, the perfect, you know, the perfect storm happened. You know, with me growing up here and. You know, that day I find I found that rock rattlesnake and it now they're, you know, the, my species, they're my favorite species. And, you know, kind of what I'm, you know, hoping to be known for and, and really focus on, you know, and it just so happens that I live right here next to them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. The, uh, the lizards you're feeding, is it mostly scoloporous? Uh, so actually, I don't I very rarely do I feed scoloporous. Um, I usually feed Yuta and Eurosaurus. Cool. Yeah. And then do you do you try and get uh, larger specimens for like scenting or do you try and find whole babies and neonates that way you can feed the whole prey item? So I, t I typically try to feed the entire lizard to whatever okay. snake I'm feeding. Um, but I also do like to vary the snake's diet, which I kind of, you know, talked about in, in the last time that we had spoke. Um, but I kind of like to vary their diet and make sure that they're not only getting pinkies but they're also getting lizards and sure. as they as they grow they also get lizards of various sizes and you know pinkies or fuzzies or hoppers depending on whatever size you know sometimes a a, a three-year-old snake gets three big pinkies instead of a hopper you know yeah because that's the kind of that's the kind of things that they're going to run into in the wild yeah they're not going to get a small rat in the wild it's just not going to happen no <laughs> Not yeah. yeah. No, I think I think it's it's excellent. I, I sadly, so many people just revert to mammals for everything. Yeah. And regardless of regardless of what the snake actually eats, it's convenient for the keeper. So they just you know they just chuck mammals down its neck. Right. Whereas you know if you look at the diet of most or a lot of the venomous snakes, mammals make up a tiny fraction of what they actually eat. They're not, you know, evolutionary wise, they're not designed to digest that much fat and fur. No. You know, most of them are either birds or lizards, which yeah. are, you know, you know, which are very, very similar in their fat and um, muscle composition. Yeah. And 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 it's the problem is, you know, and I know that I'll probably ruffle some feather, feathers by saying this, but people have just become lazy in their keeping, I I feel like. You know, everybody wants a, a slide out shoebox container that with yeah. a paper towel that they can just easily pull out. Why? Because the animal still eats on it, because the animal still takes a shit on it, because on, on occasion, the animals still do breed on that stuff, you know. But for me, it's again, I mean, it's a, it's about the animal to me. It's about the snake to me. They don't have a choice whether they're in captivity or not. We we impose that on them. Sure. So. so whether how difficult it is or not to, to provide them with a good cage, you know, for a good prison cell. Um, it, I think it's necessary. You know, you're lazy if you're not doing that stuff, man. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It's difficult. I won't, I won't lie. I mean, I probably have about 160 cages, including my baby cages that I have to set up with, 
you know, dirt and leaf litter and logs and moss and rocks and plants. And it's hard. It really is hard. But I will say that I've seen a huge, huge increase in my snakes uh, production over the course of the last few years, over their growth rates in the last few years by doing things the way that I am. What do you um, what do you do for lighting for your snakes? So I have I just have an overhead light uh, in both of my rooms. Um, it's a 6500 K light and I have that on a timer that uh, it turns on when the sun comes up and turns off when the sun goes down. And then my actual basking lights, I use 20 watt halogen bulbs. Okay. Are you, are you using any UV or anything like that? <laughs> no, I don't use any UV. No, don't use. I have just switched everything over. I now have for my uh, rattlesnakes, I have UV in every cage. And I have um, UVA and UVB and deep heat emitters. And the behavior is is, fab, is absolutely fantastic. It really, they seem to really appreciate it. And full spectrum lighting as well, they just seem to really appreciate it. Now, whether that's me amplitomorphizing or something, I don't know. But they just seem to really, just seem to pop, the colors seem to pop. They just seem to be more active. It just seems to really uh, work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's real. You, you've, you've kept yeah. animals long enough. You know, you've been doing this long enough um, that you know how animals behave mm -hmm. given, given certain stimuli. And if you're noticing that those type of changes in behavior, um, then they're absolutely real. And, I mean, again, I see the same things yeah. in the snakes that I'm keeping. You know, there, there's a lot. It's not... Again, I, I, I don't mean to ruffle any feathers when I say this, but there's only so much you can learn about an animal by keeping it on a paper towel, you know? Here, here. I mean, you, you're not really, you're not going to get natural behaviors out of that animal by keeping it on, on something like that. Yeah. So, so again, for, for me and people, I think, that who, who think like I do or want what I want out of keeping, um, you know, we're, we're willing and we're able to provide uh, for the animal to so that it, we can learn from them you know i can't tell you how many things that i've learned from my animals keeping them in captivity and then you know uh taking that out into the field and utilizing that in the field yeah 100 percent. do you not think it goes both ways i think people that keep a certain species if you see it in the wild if you're observing it in the wild i think your keeping at home becomes much better you're much more attuned to what that snake actually needs absolutely so, absolutely Absolutely. And I'll, I'll be honest, um, I went to Europe and I did uh, 23 days over there traveling all of Georgia. And oh, Germany. Mate, your, your pictures from Georgia, you killed it. Yeah, we did pretty good, man. I appreciate that. Who did you go out there with? Did you, did you I went out with a good friend of mine named Alexander Epler. I know, I know Alexander, yeah. And uh, uh, a guy named Ivo Perenich. Okay. You also, is it? Do you know uh, Jan Vespu as well? Yeah, he came. He came down here. I took him out to the Wacos and found him a Waco lip. Ah, uh, yeah, he's a really good friend of mine. I've been on loads of trips with him. He's a good, good guy. Awesome. But small yeah, world, it's a yeah. small world. But so yeah. what I was, what I was going to say is, you know, I went over there because I, I was keeping Vipera Kaznikovi and um, Transcaucasiana and Aspis and Amadites, and I wanted to go. I wanted to see what those animals were living in and how they were living, how I was encountering them in the wild. You know, what were they doing? What kind of temperature was I finding them at? You know, <laughs> and uh, it, it did. It kind of did the opposite of what I had hoped for it to do, because when I got back from that trip, I got rid of almost all of my Vipera. Yeah, because they're so different in, in terms of husbandry, in terms of their natural habitat. Yeah, it's so, and it's so different from American species. They are, and I just realized, you know, I I can't provide for them how I want to, how I feel is best for them. So I have no business keeping them. That's 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 to your credit. That's yeah. Did did you find um, like Georgia? Was it quite high altitude? Was it like mountain valleys? That sort of. Oh yeah. Quite humid and cold, reasonably cold. Very very cold. I mean, we were finding Denicky. It couldn't have been. It couldn't have been higher than maybe. I don't know, forty-five degrees, maybe. 
yeah. you know, Fahrenheit, I guess maybe about nine degrees Celsius. I, I personally, um, I tried keeping them. I think unless you're going to keep them outside and unless you're in a real Northern European sort of country, I don't think you're going to have any success with them at all. They're no. so um, temperature and humidity dialed in that if you're not getting the massive night drops, um, they're not going to do well. And they, 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 you know, they need ambient moisture. They need dew. They don't really drink out of water bowls or stuff like that. They're uh, exactly. very difficult species to keep. Yeah. I think uh, Kaznikova is a little bit hardier, but even that, you know, did you, um, you saw you saw them in Georgia, not Turkey, um, but you know the sort of areas they're in, the, the day and night temp drops are massive. Oh yeah, and even where we were in Georgia, it was yeah, it was some pretty crazy night drops. Yeah, I, I bet it was amazing to see one in the wild. I bet you lost your shit when you found that. So my buddy Alex actually found it probably. 25 yards away from me but yeah when i heard him yell i mean your body just turns cold you know and yeah. <laughs> i ran over there i already knew what time it was and i ran over there man i seen him holding it up in the glove and shoot. incredible and we got two of them evo actually got another one he was being attacked by a dog when he found it <laughs> really yeah man it was it was literally like biting his leg as he was finding this snake over a stump it was crazy uh, Just a wild, wild dog. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy, dude. And they're just up there in the in the fucking forest. You have no idea. And then all, all of a sudden, there's just a wild dog. Well, they uh -oh. always say they, they always say the best stories are the most painful. 100%. Yeah, I guess so. I enjoy telling it. I'm glad it wasn't painful for me. <laughs> right. Uh, how did you How did you find traveling around in Georgia? Was it Was it logistically easy? Was it safe? It was it was very easy. I felt very safe. I mean, there were some places that um, I was not welcome, you know. And Alec Alexander, he's he's really heavily tattooed, like I am, and they they they're not really feeling us in some places. But um, I will say though, one of the most absolutely annoying things about traveling there is that the livestock takes precedence. Yeah. So if if you're if you're going from one place to another and it says an hour on maps to get there you better buckle up for about five hours if there's yeah. some if there's some cows in the road because really? <laughs> they make you wait yeah wow. and it, it's like it's like traveling in the mountain when you're looking for aspis or something in the mountains of italy the roads are so windy although the distance might only be a couple of miles it's going to take you hours to get there yeah you can't drive fast and you know it's all hairpin bends not like you're used to in your country with your nice straight roads <laughs> yeah but i mean they're, they're not so straight out by kyle i mean <laughs> the uh, what? i was saying is the roads get more windy in your neck of the woods opposed to mine i mean mine's a virtual grid up down left right <laughs> right but you know we were just in uh, uh big bend with the npr crew and it literally it, it would say 2.6 miles and you're driving for over an hour because it's just winding 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 you know yeah. so what yeah. other what other species did you see in georgia did you get eriwinensis or lottie eevee or anything so i i found two eriwinensis and uh they both got away from me all right so uh one i had in my hand and i kind of like I stepped down over a rock and I slipped and instead of, you know, maybe falling on my head or something, I let the snake go and caught myself with my hand and I'll never, I'll never forgive myself. <laughs> um, but we're going back next year. So hopefully That's we cool. can. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So I, we found those, we found five. Um, I found five Transcaucasiana. I think we found oh, wow. seven total. Nice. Um, awesome. We found Dinicky, Derevsky. And then I did Derevsky. Nice. Yeah, we, we did Derevsky. Um, that's, a rare, that's a rare snake to find. That's hard. They're pretty rare. I'll tell you what, though. The, the spot we went to, we just we were driving around, you know, in an area where we kind of thought they could be. And we just looked at this big old hill. And we were like, all right, well, let's drive over there. And we did it. Somehow or another, we got over there. And, uh, I mean, we found like six in maybe 20 minutes or something. 
it was it was just the perfect time of day it had just kind of sprinkled and it was awesome it was awesome but we found those um we found um macro vipera lebatina um and then we went to uh germany and then went i found aspis in the black forest and then went to wow. Switzerland, and I found Aspis Aspis and Aspis Atra. Oh, wow. lovely. What about the Switzerland you go? Was that Ticino or Cresciano, somewhere like that? Uh, so we, I know we went to a place probably 30 kilometers outside of uh, Lake Beale. Okay, so like sort of Bellazonia, somewhere like that. Yeah, and then we went to another spot. Um, it, was, it was in the Jura Alps. Okay. Uh, Aspis over there are another level. They're absolutely stunning. Absolutely but, insane. But again, it's high altitude. It's meadows at high altitude. Yeah. And in the daytime, the temperatures are going to be really high. But you know, it's going to be freezing at night. Absolutely yep. freezing. Yeah. And it's so it's it's wet. Everywhere's wet with dew all the time. There's it's, it's not like there's there's no dry areas. It's it's really weird. You can see yeah. why. I mean, although Aspis in captivity seem to they seem to do very well. If you're giving them what they're actually used to, the humidity's got to be really high. For sure. And and again, I mean, those were some of the things that really, you know, pushed me away from keeping them is because I can't replicate that here. No. You Have know? you seen um, Assini? Vipira Assini? No, I haven't. We we talked about going for those. Uh, Renardi actually. But, oh, okay. but that's yet to be, you know, finalized. Man, mate, we need to do a Euro Viper trip, 100%. Sign me up. There's some good spots. Because you need to see uh, Sawanai is the most beautiful, in my humble opinion, is the most beautiful European Viper. I, I want to see him. There's just so many color variations to it. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, and you need to see oh, the Tas, the Tas Gaditania. Have I'd you, love to see those. Have you seen Beres? I have not. We we looked for oh, him. My days. Yeah, we looked for him. Uh, Alexander has a spot there. He he observes about twenty animals a year, and the few days I was there, not a one. Beres is probably if I if I go out locally, Beres is probably my commonest snake to find. Wow. Um, even areas with blue ones and um, black ones, it's it's a very common snake in 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 the UK. Awesome. But. Uh, so yeah europe's got some fantastic vipers some really stunning stuff yeah it's like uh it's like the mexico of europe for vipers yeah we've got a, mean, a lot of, a lot of species in in, in, a, in a small sort of easily doable area you need to see yeah. the, all the uh, different amadites subspecies as well because they're really I, different i'd love to do it I, I it's on my plans you need to get to montenegro Yep. Montenegro has got some fantastic color variations of Amadites. Yep. Uh, Lake Skatari. And, oh. Uh, oh. Lake Sk- high yellows from Lake Skatari. Adder Island with the little tiny dwarf red ones. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's fabulous. You need to get out there. I want to. I, they're, the Lake Skatari ones are some of my favorites. Yeah, those things are stellar. Beautiful things. I'm trying to get Phil to come over. Oh, look look at at that, that. man. That's stunning. Oh, man. That's bang on. That is actually bang on for Lake Skatari as well. Wow. I keep the good stuff. That's good. (laughs) Wow. Are they um, easy to get in the US, or is is that harder to to get hold of snake? Um, They... They're off and on. I mean, there's been, there's a lot of people importing them now, um, and it seemed that there was maybe about 15 years ago there was a lot of them coming in. Um, but no, in, in in probably the last 10 years or so, I'd say maybe the last two or three years they've barely started to become available again. Okay, yeah. I would agree. I wonder I've also seen you. well, real quick. I was going to say I've also seen a lot of ones that are marked as those, and they're definitively not. They're either a completely different locality or they're they're you know muddled in some degree some kind of hybridization in some degree you know right. sold as the latter but right yeah they're um i won't disappoint you by letting you know how cheap they are in europe to buy probably the same for you buying an atrox in america they're um well i imported 
I think about 60 of them to, uh, two years ago. And all right, they're they're pretty cheap, but they're pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah. edit, edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, man. Cool. Oh, but to be fair, I mean, you have to hit them with a hammer to kill them. They are so tough, those snakes. They're uh, they can, you know, if you look at the range of habitats that they existed in Europe, from high up mountains to uh, you get a lot on, on the rubbish tips, lowland rubbish tips, and stuff like that. They're, they're literally everywhere, and they seem to cope with everything. Yeah, that's that's they're like the Aatrox over there. Yeah, but I'd still like to see them. I mean, if if those were our Aatrox over here, I'd be delighted. A hundred percent. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen all the subspecies except for uh, Gregor Warner Eye, which doesn't really exist anymore, but I still like to see it. That's the Austrian ones. But I've yeah, I, I actually, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Freddie Walner. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess uh, it was his dad, Gregory. Yeah. So I actually went and visited Freddie there uh, in Austria oh, and, wow. saw, and saw the hillside where uh, wow. the Gregor, Wal Gregor Walner Eyes are still at. Oh, that's a, see. That's the other thing that's unusual, and I don't want to annoy anybody. But most Americans don't travel, and you're no. killing it. You know, and I appreciate America's a very big place, and it's it, you know, just going herping in America is is quite an undertaking because you know the flight times are probably just as long. But um, to go to as many places in Europe to herp as you have is is quite an achievement. I can't, there can't be many U.S. herpers that have herped in Europe as much. Um, I guess not. Um, I know, I know definitely a few, maybe five or so people that have gone to several places over there, uh, but definitely not, not too many. So I, I feel fortunate, you know, to have made friends over there and, you know, kind of got, I, I pretty much got the treatment, you know, the, the grand tour. Oh, yeah. Um, we had to really work, you know, our asses off for some of the snakes that we did find. Um, and we, we went to, we found spots on our own, but we pretty much had a baseline for what we were looking for, you know? So I'm very grateful for that. That's cool. You need to come over and see, uh, the new one, Vazla's Viper. I, I do. A, that's in a tiny little area. I saw, I saw that a little while ago. That was, that was cool. And, uh, awesome. and Greca as well is a stunning snake for Pira Greca. That, that was a hard find. That took me a long while to find, and it's not a particularly uh, pleasant area to hurt. It's, uh, it's quite brutal and uh, sparse, but uh, it's worth it when you find one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I actually i am not familiar with that, my pair. It, it's, um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was split in about 2018, maybe. Um, but it, I'll, I'll send you some pictures. It's a stunning... It's almost if you crossed a nice asp with an amadites, so it doesn't. It's um, it doesn't have the pointy nose, but it has the sort of amadites pattern on its back. It's really cool. Wow! But another um, montane species, and um, it's very barren. It's like bare rock hillsides where it's from. Wow! That's so incredible it, how they live. Yeah, I mean, we, we herped hard herping for three days without seeing a single species and i mean not a lizard or anything so what this wow. was eat, what they're eating and then uh, we found one and it was chunky as anything so you know what are, whether they're eating voles that are under the ground or yeah it, it's you know and this area you've got to think for three months of the year is under snow so it's not like they've got a massive amount of time to yeah to stock up on food so a tough species yeah that's amazing yeah, yet another reason why I love snakes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. They're awesome. Fellas, um, will you give me just a second? I'm going to go grab a glass of water real quick. Of course, of course. Just one second. Yeah. Absolutely incredible, man. Now, mate, to try, for somebody that's, you know, for so far away, to be herping as much in Europe, that's outstanding. Yeah. You know? Yeah. People... I was not slagging people off, but because of the proximity of places like Costa Rica or so on, Bali, Fiji, and that lot to the US, people tend to go in that direction, Central America, yeah. Panama, places like that. And, and sure. why wouldn't you? It, you know, it's it's cheaper and the species are fantastic. Oh, yeah. But for, but for somebody to, you know, to fly in the other direction and, and start herping 
some serious places in in Europe. You know, yeah. is you know to to go and find vipers in Switzerland is a good trip. It is a really good trip. Absolutely. And to you know Georgia as well. Georgia is 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 the sort of barrier between not barrier between but it's a sort of the area between Europe and Asia. Yeah. So you're getting such a mix of species there and such specialized mountain species. Legit uh, Transcaucasia. Doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it, I, you know, whether it's a different species or not, it, you know, it's certainly a stunning, stunning snake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think I, that it, it's also very interesting, too, is because you look at someone like him who clearly has done copious amounts of homework to the point where now he's traveled to Europe in search of his beloved species. But yeah, there's so many herpers, there's so many Americans, let alone herpers, that don't even know where Georgia is or that Georgia is even a country. And that is, I think needs to, needs to change a little bit because there's so much out there. And I think it's, it's heading in that direction and more people, hopefully people can listen to this and, you know, maybe this will spark some interest. I hope so. I mean, Europe has got some amazing herps. It's, you know, I can't remember what it's amazing. It's, it's got about 220, 230 species of herp. And Unlike America, our, our herps are, are in dense sort of pockets. So if, if you go, you can generally find quite a few species in, in a single area. It's, it's well worth, you know, and it's very easy to travel between countries in Europe. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Uh, and we have got, a, you know, a lot of very iconic vipers. It's, it's well worth the trip. Oh, yeah. And we're close, you know, from Europe. It's only a few hours by boat to Morocco. And then you're talking a whole world of vipers. Now Morocco, you're talking. You know, or even, you know, from Europe to Israel is literally slipper distance. It's, yeah. And then you're talking another huge raft of different species. That's it, man. As soon as uh, this pandemic lightens up, man, I'm that passport's getting renewed and, you know, North Africa, Near East, here I come. So. We, we we've got to do Israel, mate. We've we got have to. to. That's what I want. We got to do. I got to do Israel with you. We got to do Morocco and West Sahara. I got to go down to South Africa. The dark continent calls to me, friend. My uh, my chum Jurgen, um, who has got a phenomenal collection of rattlesnakes, um, he's also in Namibia at the moment. Really. Yeah, and he's just posting back some lovely pictures of some little bird adders and stuff like that. Oh man! Cool. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I think I, uh, I think I briefly saw something about uh, Jurgen Gebhardt, right? He's uh, yeah. his wife just found uh, <laughs> <laughs> found one for him. I guess yeah, they got out of the car and uh, she she said, "Hey, there's a snake here," and he went over there and it was a little That's adder. It. That's, That's brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, That's always then, the way. Kyle, you kept some dwarf bitters too, right? Yeah, uh, I, I still mess with a couple of them. Um, but the, again, I just I don't keep them here because they're very difficult for me to keep alongside what I do. Yeah, of course. You no. Know? Um, but but I but there is a way that I've been working on and I figured out how to keep them, you know, in this in the same room uh, by by just doing a little bit of you know, work to their cages and kind of sealing them off and being able sure. to control the actual climate inside the cage as opposed to everything outside. Yeah, that's good. So, Which yeah. Which species of it is you keeping now? Caudalis, Cornuda, um, and Rubida. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Are you going to produce any this year or no? No. No, I'm, I'm probably looking at another year or two minimum. Okay. They're, they're yeah. awesome little snakes, man. I mean, they're they're every bit as cool as, you know, the Vipera in Europe and the Montane Croats in the States, man. They're all kind of on the same level for me, you know. They're those little short bodied uh, vipers, man. They're they're hard to beat. And yeah, that's man. the that's the thing. I it's really weird, but I'm completely with you. I like the little small stubby stuff. I don't like the great big showy stuff. I like the little stuff. It's yeah, whether that's uh, whether that's because it's easy to keep. Or whether that's I don't know. It's just I really like it. It's um, same. We got some, we got some tiny species. Have, have you seen um, Monticola in uh, Morocco? I've not uh, I've not ever I'm, laid eyes on them, but I know how how they are. I, I would yeah. love to get some of those. I mean, we're talking something as long as a pencil. Oh this my is gosh! <laughs> you know, it's just brilliant. 
Oh, I mean, what do you do with the babies on those things? Oh, right? God, you must. Uh, there's um. Oh, Phil will know. What's the tiny? Oh, Sten is it Stenodactylus? What's the yeah, tiny? Sten is it Stenodactylus? Which is the very tiny? Oh, Triplicotus is not Triplicotus. Oh, I don't something. remember the species name. Tiny little sand geckos that are fully grown at about an inch and a half. Oh they my gosh. They must yeah. be eating the juveniles of them. That's the yeah. average, you know, it's of course. incredible. It really is. It, it's it blows my mind, you know, how, how stuff is able to thrive out there. Even some of the stuff I produce, you know, baby price I. Oh yeah. Warren, it's like what what the hell are you guys eating out there? Yeah. You know, I, I don't even, it's, it blows me away. I, insects, I guess, but I, I I mean, it's like, they don't even, they don't want to live, you know, they don't want to yeah. eat anything. That's mad. Do you, um, so you, you keep, I presume you keep Lepidus clauberi. That's, that's, how can, do you keep them with Pricey Eye? I keep them in the same room. Yes. Yeah. And the but, temperature, so, temperatures are okay for that. Yeah. So my the way that I have my room set up, my cold room is, uh, I, the temperature fluctuation from top to bottom is about nine degrees on any given day, and so I keep my cooler species down lower in the room, and I also have a fan that's pointed down at the floor, circulating the air on the floor, and I also have a you know my air conditioner and another fan up top facing sideways circulating the warmer air in the top of the room so i kind of am able to you know control even on one side of the room if i wanted it to i could blow my air conditioner uh, vents over on that side and i can have an entire side of my room about 10 to 12 degrees cooler than the other side awesome so and and that's enough you know 10 degrees is enough difference you know for some of these species to be able to breed so let me ask you this real quick so Obviously, we know that certain things like the pricey eye, they're obviously a higher elevation than your normal, you know, standard clobs and stuff like that. But is there a chance that those more montane species might be found or might be sustained at lower altitudes, which would be on par with, you know, some of the some of the clobs and some of the lepleps and even some of the uh, more Mexican species? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess. I guess you, you're trying to. You mean in in relation to my room, right? You know, keeping them. Yeah, together. I mean that was that was kind of my thought process was if you know if there's a clob that's at twenty one hundred feet and there's a pricey eye that's at twenty one hundred feet, why why are we giving necessarily that extra bit of attention to the pricey eye per se when they're they're literally at the same? You, right. You know, okay. No, no, no. I do. I do see what you're saying. So. I don't know. You know, that that's a good question, man. And I'd kind of I wish a lot more people would discuss stuff like that because um, I try to breed price eye for, I think, four years. Maybe it was five before I actually produced a litter. And when I started producing, you know, my the first litter and then consecutive litters after that, it was all it took seven degrees. It took me dropping my temperature in their cages seven degrees. That's it. And from that point on, I could breed them at those temperatures. Wow. So, you know, it's it's hard to say. I mean, maybe, maybe yeah, in some ranges, you know, there are clobberide, you know, that go up as high as, as price eye and vice versa. You know, there's price eye that are coming down low enough to be able to kind of mingle with clobs. Yeah. Um, is that where they spend the vast majority of their time? I, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure, you know, maybe, maybe a male club is going up that high, you know, in hopes that he's going to find a female or he's on a scent trail of a female or, yeah, you know, wh whatever, maybe he's looking for a new home or something. Um, and same with the price side, you know, we don't really know why some of them come down as low as they do, but in, in general, um, you know, price eye and Willard eye and clobber eye are all fine found at varying elevations. Uh, and that's because they, they each fill a niche in that area. Yeah. So, just talk us through what what is your actual collection, species wise. What what have you got? I have clobberi, lepidus, maculosis, marulus. Um, I have willard eye silus, 
Willard I Amobilis, Willard I Willard I, uh, I have Achilles, Price I, Pictogaster, Polystictus, uh, a couple of Vipera Amidites. What else? Some hell of a list. I have some some specs. Uh, I do keep some pygmy rattlesnakes, some from Florida, some from Georgia. Um, what else? I know I got something else out there. Oh, I actually have a, a pair of pyros, a pair of uh, mountain king snakes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 special animals to me. Uh, some good friends of mine collected them. One of them I was um, kind of not present for, but up the up the slope, and um, they're from a really really special place, man, that I hold close to my heart, to, and they're from some really good people. So I, I'm keeping those, and they'll be the only non venomous, you know, snakes that I work with. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. The uh, the Achilles was is high on my list of something I want to get hold of. They're uh, they're not cheap in Europe, but they are stunning little things. It sort of yeah, fits, it fits in with what I'm the direction I'm going with with my snakes. So there's something I'm really interested in. Yeah, they're they're awesome, man. I, I just bought a group of them yesterday. They actually came in last night, um, and they're they're uh, they're. Not cheap, for sure. Yeah, not cheap. So, yeah. and and I imagine they're either around the same price or maybe even a little more expensive there in in Europe. Uh, you're probably looking at the minute. You're probably looking about seven to eight hundred euros for a pair. That that's about what they go for here. Yeah, that that's about what they go for. But uh, they, they, yeah, they, I wouldn't say they're they're not common. But you do see them at a lot of sh- at a lot of the venomous shows, so uh, hopefully it won't be too long before I get those. Awesome, then, yeah. And then clouds and le- 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 more pygmies. Just doesn't stop. Never stops. It never I stops. I know. You te- it's it absolutely is crazy. I I moved out probably around a hundred. Maybe a hundred or so snakes this year, maybe 120. And um, just in the last week, you know, I work out of town and I've been home a week now and I've already acquired, I think, uh, like 25 new snakes in a week. And it's like, what are you doing, man? But you, like you said, you, you can't stop. There's there's no stopping, you know? Yeah, you got you to you gotta strike when the iron's hot. Exactly. Yeah, then you, you know you're you're like okay, man. My collection is awesome. I really love where my collection is at, you know. And then lo and behold, you, you find something or somebody posts something that you never see available. You had no idea was out there. You have to have it. It's so. normally it's normally hurt Mexico online or something like that. You'll see something and you'll just think, "Oh my days! I've got to get some of those." I gotta have that. Yep. I mean, Mexico. Have you hurt much in Mexico? Oh yeah. Yeah, how, how is yeah. that? I mean, the, uh, it's it's one of my dream places to go and herp for obvious reasons, but it it just doesn't seem to me, particularly as a European, that the safest place to be walking around with lots of expensive camera equipment and uh, looking like you might be a narco or something. Well, I you'd be better off down there than I am. I, in, in all honesty, I mean, I I look, I don't, I don't look you know, inviting down there. Um, in, in a lot of places, people are very nice to me and, and you know, very accommodating, um, super polite. And other places, I mean, you can't get people to look you in the eyes, you know. A, 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 you just, there's a real eerie feeling, you know, it's just off. Um, but but I've never really, my you know, minus two times that I can, that I can recall, I've never really felt like I, I'm in danger or, you know, I, I shouldn't be in certain places. You all, you sometimes have that feeling, you know, where it's like, okay, you know, maybe this isn't the best of, of spots, but you're not in any danger. You're just not any of the places that I've been going to, you know. Um, now, Sinaloa and Durango, you know, you get down there and you're going to run into some problems, you know. 
down there, and I know people who have. But in much of the northern Mexico, you're 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 relatively good. Are you going to get hassled by the cops and and taken for twenty bucks here and fifty there? And yeah, yeah, you you absolutely are, man. But that's just part of Mexico, period. And what's what sort of species were you encountering when you was there, venomous wise? Um, so I found clobs there, price eye. Uh, Willard Eye, Silas, Amabilis, Achilles, Ravis. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Marulis, a bunch of Marulis, uh, a bunch of Miquihanis, uh, Price Eye Miquihanis, um, various lizards, you know, Baricia, uh, Imbricata. The uh, spiny lizards down there are very, very plentiful and they're awesome. I mean, they are legitimately glowing blue um what else have i seen down there man i I'm, i know i'm missing a bunch but i mean oh we went in and uh we did um mixed coatlis melanuris that was probably to date my one top five favorite snakes i've ever seen in the field wow yeah they're they're incredible snakes man they're they're right up there with you know montane rattlesnakes and vipera kaznikovi and and the likes of those um, but yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I found, you know, Simus, uh, a bunch of the microoides down there, um, some, uh, blunt headed tree snakes, um, some DOR boas, you know, but a, a bunch of stuff. I mean, I've, I've been down to Mexico quite a bit. That's amazing. I'd love to go. I'd love to go. I've got to go. I've got to tick off all the American rattlesnakes before I head off to Mexico. Yeah, as soon as, soon as quarantine's finished, I was supposed to be on on the on the trip with the NPR guys that had just been around Arizona, and for a late trip, they really cleaned up and they saw some great stuff, uh, awesome. including including Willardi, which is my number one snake to see in the in the US. Really, um, so I was gutted that I couldn't I couldn't go on that trip because of obviously. No Europeans being allowed into the States at that particular time, but oh, mate. <laughs> it's such a tease. It is killing me here. It really such is. Such a tease. That's beautiful. Yeah. 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 That's my number. I have, one. Uh, I have like 20, 20 Willard Eye Willard Eye now. Of course you do. Wow. Shitload, man. Yeah. I, I, I bought a I bought a group of babies this year and had some born myself and I mean, I think I have uh, 14, 14 babies and three adults. Wow. We, yeah, that's my number one snake I want to keep and my number one snake I want to see in the wild at the moment. Um, I don't blame they you. Are, they are extortionate in Europe, absolutely extortionate. You're looking for a pair. The cheapest pair you're going to find is about three and a half grand. Yeah. They're, 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 they hold their value quite rightly. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing snake. I don't begrudge paying that. You know, people pay that for some genetic garbage. So exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So you've hurt Mexico and you've hurt quite a few places in Europe. Where, where's where do you want to go where you haven't been? Uh, I want to go do Dwarfitis in South Africa. My man, <laughs> Namakwalan and Springbok and. I want to, you know, hit all those places and and find all that stuff. I really want to do um, cataphractus also. I think that I mean that would be just, you know, that those are those are animals that you see on TV and like you know Steve Irwin when you're a little kid, you know, and you just kind of those those things are just become iconic in your, you know, your background. So I think it'd be awesome to 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 see that stuff down there and get to experience it, you know, breathe the air in South Africa. 100%. Do you fancy Australia at all, or is elapids not your thing? Um, yeah, elapids, elapids don't really do anything for me, though I will say I would love to see them in, in the wild. Um, they're just not a priority. Will I, will I do it someday? Absolutely, I, and I look forward to it. But, you know, if I, if I had to prioritize, they'd certainly be on the lower end of the totem pole for me but here's something that not a lot of people know about me um i actually am a huge sucker for geckos myself 
God. Really? I mean, I really oh, am. You know, I'm not too too deep into the species, and I'm not familiar, you know, with all the localities and stuff like that. But when me and my buddy uh, about four years ago were kind of planning a trip to Australia, we were going to go see, you know, the green trees and all the big pythons and olives and uh, maclots and all that stuff. And during during the course of the time that we were kind of like planning out our trip a lot of the places and stops that were going to be, you know, where I wanted to go were for geckos. Oh, nice. Mate. You know? I, can complete. I think I'm exactly the same as you. Australia is interesting, but it's very, very far down on my list of places that I want to go compared to other places. But if I go to Australia, I'm not going to be looking for pythons. For me, it's velvet geckos and strophrums. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, man. Knob, knobtails and things like that. I'd much rather see that than a woma. I mean, you know, if I saw yeah. a woma, it would be cool, but I'd be actively searching for knobtails and velvet geckos and right. leaf, leaf tails and things like that. Just insane. 100%. Right. 100%. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Oh. So a- anywhere else apart from... Uh, Australia or I'd, I'd like to do uh, I'd like to do Asia uh, I'd like to do a few places in, in Asia um, Thailand I think would be really really cool um, there's a, a lot of diversity there uh, what, about, what about trims do they float your boat or you're not that bothered about them yeah no, I, I used to have a reasonable collection of trimmerosaurus but um they're all green. They all kind of look the same after a while. Yeah. And I mean, I, again, would I, would I like to see them in the wild? Absolutely. I mean, I would love that. But yeah, in captivity, they just don't really do much for me. You know, none of the arboreal stuff is just, I don't know. They, they, they're not interesting to, to, for me. You know, they don't, they don't have daily habits. You know, they don't, they don't behave in predictable ways, you know, they're just kind of there on a branch, you know. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I keep squams and uh, clarecus and uh, bits and bobs of broadly eye, um, but I'm th- I'm thinning them out, and it's just going to be rattlesnakes. Yeah, and they're awesome. I mean, squams are incredible. Eyelash wipers are incredible. I mean, there's. There's a couple of people in the States now who are really doing really well with eyelash vipers and uh, at least two guys I know who are doing really well with squams. And I mean, man, they're just putting out some crazy stuff. I would yeah. say I would say in comparison, you know, species wise that they're they're putting out as good a stuff as I think I am with with the montane stuff. You know, the sure. cobbler I do. Sure. So and I, I like that. I like seeing that kind of stuff. I like seeing people dedicated to their craft like that and really being successful and, and putting that out there for other people to see. I I, I respect that. Yeah. Is there is there many people apart from yourself? Are there, is there many people in the states that have collections of European vipers? Is it a thing out there or? No, um, I mean there are people who have a pair of this or that or maybe six pair of amadites or something, right. but nobody nobody's really that serious with them. I mean, they they just have a couple, you know, and, and that's, that's really the kind of theme in, in most of the venomous hobby nowadays. I feel like in the United States anyway, you know, again, people, people, I think a lot of people do it for the wrong reasons. You sure. know, they, they want some kind of notoriety, what kind, I'm not sure, or, you know, from their friends or, or, or whatever peers. Um, but people just kind of keep a hodgepodge of, of, you know, I have an Atrox here and I have a black tail and I have two spitting cobras that are males. You know, I have one monocled cobra, you know, that's 13 years old, just random stuff all over the place. You know, they're yeah. not focused. They're not really trying to learn anything about the species they keep. They just keep them because they're cool. You know, they they have pretty colors. You couldn't, most of the keepers nowadays, you 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 couldn't ask them to point out where their species live on a map. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, it's that serious, you know. It, it's really gotten to that point, right? And, and and so I feel like the you know the people who really really keep and really have a, a large um, 
a number of animals that they're dedicated to and a species genre that they really focus on. Those people are kind of few and far between nowadays. Yeah. I think, and I've, I've said this a lot before, um, and I've chatted with a lot of people about it. I think, as we've said, we all go through stages and one of those stages is trying to keep as much stuff as possible of every different sure. thing. Right. And then you, then you, as, as I would say, as you get older, as you get more experience is probably a better way to put it. You know what brings you joy and then you start concentrating on that. I mean, Phil has just gone down a complete African rabbit hole now. Just about everything he owns is <laughs> sub-Saharan Africa. If it's not gone sand, he's not interested. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I'm thinning out. I've, I've, I've had a lot of Asian stuff. I'm thinning just all the snakes out and just keeping rattlesnakes now. Um, and yourself, you're even more specific, just the Montane route snakes. I think it's fantastic. I definitely think it's the way yeah. to go. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, another piece of, of why I keep what I keep is because, you know, don't get me wrong. I feel like all of us have this in common. I, I really truthfully love all snakes, you know, sure. I, I, and I and I appreciate all snakes. And to and if I had as much space that I needed at my fingertips and as much money as I needed to house the collection that I truly wanted, then yeah, I'd keep eyelash vipers. I, I would keep a big collection of, of European vipers and stuff like that. But the reality is I just can't. And I, I know that those animals, even though I like them a lot, and even though I'd love to keep them a lot, they're not my favorite animals. And so I feel that by keeping an animal that's not your favorite, you're just kind of doing it an injustice. Yeah, 100%. You know, so so now every animal I can confidently say, you know, that I have in my collection is my favorite. You know, people, what's your favorite snake? And I mean, I do have a favorite snake. It's my the one on my logo and, you know, the Franklin girl that the world knows now. Yeah. Um, but, but, but otherwise, I mean, they're all my favorites, you know. It, it's... I love every one of them, you know, I, I take equal time and care, you know, for every single one of them. They, they all get the same bit for me. Yeah, it, it's good to walk into your snake building or your snake room and it always makes you smile. You look around and it brings you some joy as opposed to you walk in there and you think, oh, I've got to do this again. Right, yeah, right. You know? When it yeah. gets to the stage when you're just looking around and it becomes a chore, you need to stop doing it, thin yeah, your collection yep. out, you know. It, Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I walk in, I look at, you know, I've got, as soon as I walk in, I've got a, a, a naturalistic viv. It's just got three pygmy rattlesnakes in with some really nice lighting. Every, it's the first thing I see when I walk in. It just makes me smile every time. It's just absolutely brilliant. Yep. Yeah. So talking about your herping, because you do do a lot of herping, which I think is outstanding. How do you plan a trip? What, what sort of your factors for planning a trip? I mean, that's a that's a kind of a broad question. Uh, planning as far as how what I'm targeting or. Yeah, I mean, safety wise, what equipment you're going to take? How do you research the species that you're you're after? I mean, it's very easy. I say it's very easy. It's easier now because everyone can just go on Google Earth and I naturalist. And, you know, not yeah. like the old days where you actually actually try and read books and papers and try and find out yeah. where they, they were was from. But yeah, so what's, what's, what is that thing called, a roadmap? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be like that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, in over the course of the last few years, I've, I've really become, uh, I guess you can kind of say like a club snob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I really don't, I really don't go for, for many other species anymore. I mean, I've, Again, you know, I've, I've been out there and I found them and I found enough of them to know that I don't want to keep finding a, a bunch of them. You know, Willard and I are super, super cool. And I hope I get to see a ton more in the field. But if I had to pick a mountain range to, to go camping in where I could find either Willard eye or clobber eye, I'm certainly going to find clobber eye. And you're still getting it. You're still getting excited about seeing them, even though you've seen them so much. Oh, every time. I mean, I've, I've seen upwards of a thousand clobber eye now in the wild. And every single time I see one, man, it, the, the feeling that I get throughout my entire body is just like day one. I mean, 
that's why I can't stop. I mean, it's literally like a drug for me, you know, that as soon as I find one, the high that I get, I mean, the, the, that massive, you know, dopamine release is just, it's why I keep doing it, you know, and nothing else does that for me. You know, when I find a Willard eye, I don't get, I do get excited, but I, but I don't get the same rush as when I find a clobber eye and, you know, same with, same with even like the Vipers in Europe. I was, I was super excited to go see some of those things and I've been wanting to for, you know, 15 years. And, and I was, I was very, very excited and happy to be seeing them, but still not what a club brings me, you know? And, and so that's what I go for now. You know, I, I want to learn every single thing that I can about clubs in every single mountain range that I possibly can. You know, I want to continue seeing, you know, how far I can push the limits, you know, what, what do they look like in this Canyon, in this Canyon, in that Canyon, you know, what time of day can I find the most, you know, how, how many days in a row can I find, you know, two snakes a day or, you know, stuff like that. You know, I just, just kind of try to challenge myself out there and, and it keeps me going. Uh, I completely agree. It is so addictive. Field herping is so addictive. Yeah. You know, you know, it, uh, we've all we've all been field herping you know you're so you're spending hours and hours looking for something which if you thought of, think about the odds of you actually finding it are absolutely minute yeah but, but as you say the adrenaline rush when you actually find a target species is just insane it's unreal yeah yeah have you ever have you ever put like i don't want to say trail cams or some kind of video recording or like time lapse recording on a, a, a den site or a burrow or for, for any of the clubs that you've seen in a while? So I've there's only two places that I know of where clubs kind of I wouldn't even say den really, but kind of congregate, you know, for a couple of months out of the year. Yeah, it's, uh, it, happen, it happens to be the ultimate perfect spot for that time of year, so they all congregate. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and I, I, I think it's just by happen chance, you know, in other places in the same mountain range, it, it's not happening. It's not it's not occurring, at least not that I've found or anyone I know has found. Um, but. No, I, I never have. Um, I guess I just don't feel confident enough that I'll be able to, you know, have a. a what am I trying to, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, I wouldn't be able to have like a continual data set on them, you know, because they're just not that active. You, you yeah. know, you might go there for three days out of the year and be able to see seven or, or eight clubs, you know, coming out of one crack. But to put a camera on that and try to hope hope you get that, you know. Yeah, yeah but, basically they're habitual but nowhere near as habitual as you need them to be to do something like that. Right. Okay. Like a, like a Serb den, you can put one on a Serb den sure. or even like a, a Melosis den. And you pretty much know they're coming out, you know, every morning and they're going to, you know, give you some kind of show, but the clubs there, they don't do that. You know, some mornings there's one male at the crack and then everyone's behind him and you can't see him. Sometimes there's, you know, five snakes that you can see from the crack Sometimes there's three completely out and one inside, you know, but, but it's very, very random. Wow. Very cool. So but, um, when you're in the field, what, what sort of, um, what camera are you taking? Cause your pictures are outstanding. Please don't tell me you're just taking them on a cell phone. I shoot with a Sony a seven two. Right. So I use that. I have a couple of different lenses that I use. My favorite lens is a 90 millimeter macro. Uh, and then I also have a 16 millimeter wide angle lens uh, that I've just kind of began playing around with and shooting with, you know, to kind of get the habitat shots and stuff with the snake. But I'll be honest. I mean, I feel like a lot of people are kind of doing that now. And I, I'm, I really like to do different stuff, you know, and that's why, you know, uh, Phil earlier was talking about the pictures. I, I usually take a good close up picture of a snake and that's what I post. Um, yeah. You don't really see a lot of people doing too much of that anymore. It, it's mm. you know everybody's trying to get the habitat and the, the big vista. Yeah. Shots and everything's snake in the bottom left hand corner and see yeah. the rest of the shot. Yeah, yeah. It's just too. It's. 
I don't know. There's too much of that going around, you know, for, for me to want to have to get in there. And I hate to use this word, you know, but compete with other people's images. And I just stick to my own style and, and what I'm good at. And I roll with that, you know, and so far it seems to, you know, people seem to be liking it. So. hundred percent. I mean, so your Instagram, the images are amazing, uh, which kind of leads me on to something else, which is, I won't say dear to fill a mind's heart, but it's something that we moan at each other about or chew the fat over. Um, you're, you've got a decent Instagram following without free handling anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? It's amazing. How'd you do that? <laughs> you know, I thought to get to get followers on Instagram, you've got to um, be bopping a cobra on the head or... Uh, yeah. How, how do you feel about the free handlers? I... I'll say this. I do not agree with it, though I do agree that people should be able to do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, I do feel, though, like anybody who truly cares about the hobby and about where it's going in the near future shouldn't be doing stuff like that, man. I mean, you're, you're, you're making it worse, you know, by showing people that – you can put your hands on these animals and not get bit that instills in a lot of kids, you know, the impressionable kids that you can put your hands on these, these dangerous animals and be that cool guy and get all these likes on Instagram and walk away from it. scot free. When in reality, that's, that's likely not going to happen. Yeah. You know, you, the, a kid that goes out there, he doesn't know that, that this guy in this video chilled that snake for 20 minutes, you know, or he doesn't know that this guy in the video has had that snake and knows its behaviors for 12 years, you know, yeah. oh, these kids go out there and they, all that they know is I saw this exact snake be picked up this it like this by somebody else. I'm going to do it. I, why can't I try it? You know? And that's, that's where shit goes wrong. And that's what I don't agree with it for i i i'm guilty of it myself sometimes i mean i'm not i'm not even gonna lie you know when i have babies born here and i gotta pull them out of the cage or something i cannot help myself every now and again i will plop one fresh born three hours old in my hand you know and and look at it and you know just bring it you know close to me and and you know get a good look at it you know because it doesn't know any better and i know that because i know my snakes I, I know the species I keep, you know, but would I ever take a photo of that and post it and share it with people? Absolutely not. There's no reason for that. I'm making my own decision on my own time. I don't need to put that out there in the world for other people to see. Yeah. You know, there, there's things that you can do in private, but, but again, and you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, people are just, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Nobody, nobody, can look me dead in the face and tell me that they hold venomous snakes because they truly like holding venomous snakes. Absolutely not. Yeah. You're holding that animal because you want a reaction. You're holding the animal because it brings you a feeling, whether that feeling is of power or intimidation, you know, to, to your peers, whatever it does, it's bringing you a feeling I assure you that you don't like handling that animal. You like the feeling that handling that animal is bringing you. Yeah, very well put. So yeah. it's, it's for the wrong reasons. At, at, even when I do it, you know, I just told you the reasons why I do it, but they're still the wrong reasons. There is no reason to put your hands on a venomous snake. There just isn't. Yeah. You know, all the tools that we have available to us nowadays, all of the information online that we have available to us nowadays – all of the stupid people who have come before us, who have posted these photos and, and their journals online telling us what happens, telling us, showing us pictures of what your hand looks like after this shit. We have all of these things readily at our fingertips, yet we don't heed any of the warnings. It's, it, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Yeah, good speech. I couldn't agree more. Sadly... I think it's going to continue for a long time. People get the Insta hits. They get yeah, the, uh, it, it absolutely will. I mean, yeah. it, it's not going anywhere. And a lot of people do it because they also like the adverse reactions. You sure. know, 
I mean, I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to give these guys any credit. But I'm, but you guys know the guys on Facebook, you know, who yeah. constantly are holding some snake or got bit by a snake, and they're they're still doing it, man. And when people comment, oh, you know, you're a dumbass, or why are you doing this? And they eat it up, dude. They yeah. they they love that kind of attention, and we just perpetuate it by feeding it to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and people are too stupid. Uh, to see that, you know, and they keep feeding it to him. Oh man, you're such an asshole. Oh dude, you're dumb as hell. Yeah. Okay. Maybe he's dumb as hell, dude, but he's getting 5,000 views on his page over you because you're bringing him attention. You're doing, you're perpetuating this, you know? I I mean, both, both Scott and Phil say the same thing. Real venomous snake handling is very boring. Yeah. It, It should be very boring. There yeah, no, there should be zero risk to it, you know. Absolutely, you're not. I, I mean, I, th- just this year, I've gotten rid of a few snakes, negressions, namely one of them, um, not because they were aggressive, but because they had crazy feeding responses. And I went into the cage one day to feed, and one of them just completely caught me off guard and scared the shit out of me. And so yeah. I sold it. I sold them, you know, I'm not going to, I cannot keep snakes that make me feel that way. Yeah. You know, if, if you, if, if you're scared, I'm not, I wasn't scared of the animal, obviously, but if you, if you have any kind of fear of the animal or what it could potentially do to you and you're not ready for those repercussions, you don't have any business keeping that animal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a, there's a fine line between, uh, me knowing, okay, I have the ability to handle this animal. I know what's going to happen or what could possibly happen because we can't predict the future. But when it becomes a, uh, I don't want to say a burden, but when it when it impedes my enjoyment of the other animals in my room, then why why keep it? Let, let someone right. else work with it who is interested, who wants to try their hand at it or already has that species. Let them let them move on with that animal so that it doesn't impede my enjoyment with mine, however that may be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way everybody needs to. Well, I don't know. I'm not saying that everybody needs to, but I feel like it would certainly help. You know, sure. if, if people viewed things like that more. Yeah. So yes. what's up? I gotta ask, man. What's up with the, the giant tweezers? Can we can we talk about the giant tweezers for just a hot second? So I don't know. I used to use barbecue tongs, dude. Nice. Um, so is that just because those giant, you know, Midwest tweezers, those are just the best for grabbing them and just, or is it because you want to be inconspicuous and not bring a snake hook into the field? No. So what it is, is the, like the old school Pilstrom tongs, you know, the Midwest yeah, ones. Sure. And they're just really. They're too big and bulky. You know, they're bulky, they're hard to carry in the field. And with the snakes that I'm out there trying to find and get my tongs on, you got to go in cracks and little holes and rocks. And you're not doing that with no big old tongs, man. You got to get, you got to, you know, have the little guys in there. Yeah. To to be able to, you know, get these things out of some of the areas that they're going into. And they're easy, you know, for me to carry around. I just I put it one of them inside of my shorts and the other one on the outside. Uh, I mean, I hike around with it. You don't even feel them or nothing. So, yeah, uh, it's just kind of something I started doing. Um, like I said, I, I used barbecue tongs at first. <laughs> I would uh, I would take a hot glue gun and uh, glue the edges of the barbecue tongs so that one, it wasn't going to like cut the snakes. Right. I put too much pressure, and two, it kind of would help me grip, grip the snakes so they didn't get out of them so easily. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do something similar. We would take. Uh, uh, we had uh, at one point somebody had pawned off on us a uh, uh, like two or three full clutches of uh, uh, spitalaps uh, lubricants. Excuse me. And they don't ride a hook worth of shit. Doesn't matter right. what the hook is. So. Henry and I took big hemostats and dipped the tips of each one in liquid latex just to give a little ch- and I would just use hemostats. I would just pick them up, move them, pick them up, move them, pick them up. It's very similar to what you're, you guys are doing. Obviously, yeah. you guys are more gentle in that regard, but 
because you're dealing with yeah. rocks and crevices and stuff. But I just I always see you guys out there in the in in the the great western frontier, and you're all happy with your your mini rattlesnakes and your giant tweezers. And I'm just like, yeah. it's got to be the best way, man, because they're all doing it. <laughs> yeah, man, it's got to be the best way. I and I don't even know kind of where the tweezers started. You know, I just I remember using barbecue tongs. And then, yeah. it, and then it, one day it became like, all right, well, I use these, you know, 16 inch feeding tongs yeah. for, for my snakes at home. And I, I'm able to grab them with these, you know, maybe if I got some longer ones, they would do good in the field and, and they did. So we just kind of started sticking with those. And I mean, there were people using them before, before even I started and I had no idea yeah. that they were being used out there. But then I started seeing a couple of pictures posted on like field herp forum and stuff. And I was like, oh man, other people are caught onto this too you know nice and i like i i'm a hemostat fanatic like hemostats and forceps are like my weapon of choice indoors if you will yeah um, but in the in the field i don't think i would ever use a hemostat or a forceps or an alligator tong because you're you're applying i feel too much pressure i feel like the the giant feeding the feeding tongs themselves those giant tweezers they have almost like a flex to them so even though you're, you're applying pressure to the animal's body, it's not going to be overbearing that you might crack a rib or something. Right. And yeah, you keep your hand far enough back and you can squeeze as hard as you want to. And at the end of those tweezers, it's barely any pressure at all. Yeah. yeah. And I, that's another reason why I like them so much too. Yeah. Brilliant, man. I love it. Yeah. I had to touch base on it. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah. So. You know someone's going to market these now and just put reptile on the side and charge three times as much for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll still buy my cheapo ones from, the, from surgical companies. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that is something I was going to ask you. Um, so talking with uh, a couple friends uh, and Matt Most, uh, he actually brought this up to to Billy Hunt and I about using different colored hemostats and forceps while feeding to eliminate a negative response to the tongs or the tweezers themselves. And essentially what Matt was doing is with certain key species, mostly uh, Asian rat snakes and a, a few other things, uh, he was using black painted hemostats and forceps so that they're not retaining that shiny silver look. And at the same time, if he dips the tweezers in water to pull out a frozen thawed prey item that happens to be in warm or hot water, that metal is not retaining the heat with some of the species that have pit receptors and stuff. Have you noticed anything like that with your mini mini stuff or no? I've not, no. Okay. Because, I mean, I, it's, at the same time, you're also doing a lot of lizards, which I imagine you're still thawing out uh, in some kind of, I don't want to say warm water or under a heat lamp of some sort. So I, I do I do fresh killed. Okay. I do fresh killed. Um, and just because I, I like to I like to keep the lizards for a little while. Uh, I like to keep the the crickets, you know, for a little while, and I feed my crickets uh, carrots and zucchinis and spinach and yeah. um, you know just a variety of different fruits and veggies, and then I'll feed those to my lizards, you know, the side blotch lizards or the tree lizards. I'll let them kind of digest those, you know, for a day or so, and then I'll feed the lizards to my snakes. So in turn, my snakes are really getting all of that yeah as well you know okay awesome and and freezing you know you just kind of you you can't you don't have that you know option yeah but now so just to going back to the whole tweezer talk so when you you grab a live prey item with your hemostats or with your forceps are you then do you then place it in front of the the specimen at hands face and strike range or do you let it go loose and let them hunt on their own i always uh, so I, I kill them first. I kill the lizard or the oh, okay. whatever I'm feeding right. first. You said fresh killed, sorry. Yeah, and that's okay. Uh, I let them bite it, though. I always let them bite it, and then I'll put it down to where they can, you know, go and, and eat it easily. Right. Okay. Do you, I... um, are you, do you have a concern about parasites in the lizards? I mean, I, there's a, a two schools of thought, and a lot of people go, oh, I'd never feel it, feel, you know, feed anything that wasn't frozen. I tend to feed, if necessarily live or fresh killed, all the time. And touch wood, I've never had a problem. But I, I know a lot of people do seem to worry about it. 
I've had a problem in the past uh, by when I fed whiptail lizards uh, to some of my snakes. Um, I no longer will feed a whiptail lizard to anything without freezing it for at least three months. Really? Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, I've and th- I had a. It was at least a couple of experiences with whiptail lizards where uh, I fed them to snakes and they. I mean, the snakes died. Mm. So. Um, I won't do that, but I've never had a problem with uh, side blotch lizards or or tree lizards that I feed. Um, and I've never really worried about it because most of what I feed, as far as tree lizards go, my adults are typically the ones that get the tree lizards. And I collect those myself from the same mountain ranges that the snakes are from. Nice. So so I, I, don't, I don't feel like there's anything really to worry about. Um, I also never have wormed a single snake of mine um, or, or, or done any kind of invasive, you know, procedure on them to try to rid them of any mites or, or worms or anything like that. I feel like if they're thriving in the wild, you know, um, and eating what they're eating in the wild, then they're going to be fine at my house, you know, and, I, and I've, I've never had a problem. Yeah. What what is your um, feeding regime? How often are you feeding the adults? It's that's a tough uh, it's a tough one to answer, I guess because um, I feed each species differently. So I I don't there's no schedule really. I mean I I kind of just will go in the room and I'll say all right you know this snake it needs to eat it's either in an ambush position uh or it's cruising the cage or it kind of, its body weight just kind of looks a little bit thin to me um and that's kind of how i judge it and so i'll i'll take a mental note of every snake in my room that i feel needs to eat something and i'll thaw out a bunch of rodents i don't count or anything like that you know i never say i need 31 fuzzies and 12 pinkies or i never do that i'll just grab you know a couple handfuls of what i think i need and um, I'll feed them to the snakes as, as I feel like they need to eat. And like I said, sometimes, you know, uh, an adult clobber eye, as opposed to giving it um, a hopper mouse, I'll give it a fuzzy and a pinky, you know, that day. Because that's what I had available and, and, and that's, you know, that's fine for that snake. You know, maybe that'll last it 12, 12 to 15 days or something like that. As, and then a, a price eye. You know, if I feed a price eye, an adult price eye, a fuzzy, that thing doesn't need to eat again for another 30 days. Yeah. You know, so I kind of just do it like that. You know, I just, I go in my room on, on any given day and just kind of, you know, look at who I think needs to eat that day. Definitely the best way to do it. Not this uh, one 90 gram mouse once a week, yeah. 360, you know, 365 days a year type thing. Yeah, that's, you know, oh, my snake eats on Sundays at 2 p.m. I, you know, yeah. I, I've never been able to wrap my mind around that kind of logic, you know. maybe yeah. Again, maybe that's easy for you and, and that, that works for you, but I assure you that that's probably not work for the snake. You know? Yeah. I, I'm yet, you know, in three decades of field herping, I'm still yet to see a fat snake in the wild. So, right. Uh, it's not yeah. happening. It doesn't happen. Yeah. So, and I try to keep mine like that. You know, I, I've seen, I feel like enough animals in the wild to kind of get a pretty good basis on what I believe my snakes need to look like. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I feed. I feed accordingly, you know. And sometimes I'll feed as a, you know, I'll feed um, two or three or four rodents. Uh, and then the fifth and sixth meal, I'll feed lizards. You know, you know, stuff like that. Or sometimes I'll feed five or six lizards and then and then one fuzzy. I just it's all different, you know, and it's there's no rhyme or or reason to any of it, really. Do you keep records on the feeding schedules and stuff? Absolutely not. Okay. You just remember, hey, I know I fed this guy two fuzzies last Thursday. You know what? Next week, I'll give him a lizard, you know. Yeah. For the most part, I I do know what I fed all of them. Um, Sometimes I, you know, it's kind of a gray area i don't i don't really yeah. re- recall what i fed them I can't but remember again, all of it yeah but again it kind of, it doesn't really matter because i'm i'm more looking at the body weight and, and sure. condition of the snake I, that's kind of what i base uh what i what i'm feeding it off of yeah uh of the species that you keep and that you have kept of the species that you have kept that you're currently still keeping excuse me 
Have you noticed um, any of them in particular having a overabundance of a particular prey item? I specifically rodents where they're defecating more undigested product or more, you know, fur or bone or whatever. Like they, like they're not designed to process that much of one particular thing or not. I guess. No, I, I, I can't, I can't really say I have. Okay. Um, I've kind of been doing feeding stuff like this for as long as I can remember. Um, I will say though, you know, as far as digesting the, the prey items, like you're talking about, I haven't really, you know, noticed too much in that regard, but I, I have noticed that feeding them nothing but rodents and, you know, uh, a certain size snake feeding it the exact same size prey item every time will get the animal fatter, much, yeah. m much fatter, a much shorter, fatter looking snake. And sure. that is, that's not what I'm going for. Right. You right. know, um, but and I, I've also noticed, and I mean, maybe this sounds kind of crazy, but it's it's real. I mean, I've I've done it enough. The more lizards that they eat, especially a growing snake, you know, a baby from a baby all the way up to kind of like a juvenile animal, the more lizards that they eat, the longer and thinner that they grow. The more rodents that they eat, the the slower they grow lengthwise, and the faster they grow widthwise. Wow. Yeah. That, that is absolutely a real thing. I have seen it time and time and time again with every single species that I keep. Wow. So I've also, there, there's something else that I've noted in the last two years or so. I breed my own mice, um, you know, and I, I feed a natural diet, nothing, nothing processed or anything like that to any of my, my feeders. Um, and I've noticed that on occasion I have my freezer stocked up with uh, – not stocked up, but I have some some spare pinkies and fuzzies and stuff in there from a company that I use called Lane Labs. Um, and I also have some of my own fro frozen rodents in there also that I've produced myself. And for whatever reason, it seems like my stuff has a different scent than, than some of the, the Lane Labs rodents because – I have baby snakes that refuse pinkies from that company or any other company that I've tried. And with the stuff that I'm breeding, they take them right away. Yeah. You know, I've seen that numerous times too in the course of the last few years, which is, it's crazy. You know, it, it, and do I you, think, do you think not to cut you off my apologies, but do you think that it's something from coming down from mom? Cause mom fed on your rodents too. I don't know if it's that or if I I think that I attribute it more to I mean you, the saying is real you know you are what you eat. Yeah. And and I mean your excrement shows that, you know, when you eat really sh McDonald's and you know, I mean dude, you're taking a nasty dump. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're not digesting it well. Your body is not does not want that shit, dude. You know, it, it wants good, clean meats and vegetables. And, you know, you feel better when you eat those kinds of things. You know, right. you, you feel better than if you were just to eat, you know, sloppy Joe's 10 times, you know, a week. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? And I, I feel really like it's the same with with the snakes, man. They, they literally are what they eat. And so are the mice. And when the mice are eating you know, that all that 26% soy block that people are feeding them from Missouri and all these other companies, you know, they, they kind of just lose their, their shine, you know, their luster, yeah. they're, they're, they're not the same mouse anymore, but sure. you know, you start feeding them crickets and, and mealworms and, and worms and just, you know, I feed my mice lizards. I mean, I literally feed them lizards, you know, and they love them, dude. They go ape shit over these things. And so I think in, in the end, what it does is my mice have a more wild type scent yeah. than any other kind of captive rodent does. And it's because of what they're eating. That's brilliant. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, it's helped me a lot, man. I, I, I will say that. I mean, if, if I had to put a finger on anything that's helped me the most as far as keeping goes, it's breeding my own rodents and providing them with 100% natural diet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm exactly the same. I've stopped breeding rodents now, but for all the uh, insectivorous stuff, I did exactly the same as you. I, I will keep them for a week or two just on, you know, feeding them on plants that are my garden. Yeah. And then feed them to the geckos and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yep. You have to, man. And, you know, a lot of people do that for lizards. Um, you know, they, they call it gut loading. You know, you gut load yeah. the crickets and... I don't know why that has not translated into snakes. You know, people that keep snakes, people just don't think that snakes need that kind of variety and those, all those types of vitamins and nutrients that they're pulling from these other resources. Yeah. I think the, the, pro the problem is I think snakes in general are so hardy that you can keep them for a long time in subpar conditions. And they're, yeah, they're, that they survive. They don't thrive. You know, that is and, very true. Yeah. And as, as you said earlier, and I think, you know, we all agree, we as keepers, we, we should be giving the snake its absolutely best existence that we can as keepers. Um, and yeah, we should be looking at the diet. We should be looking at the temperatures. We should be looking at, you know, lighting and all of those things just to try and give it the absolute spot on best lifestyle. You have to. I mean, you, you, you just... You have to. And if you're not if you're not willing or ready to provide an animal with what it really deserves and needs, then you have no business keeping that animal. Yeah. 100%. You know? you're, you're absolutely selfish if you keep that animal any other way. In, 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 my, in my opinion, I, I, I feel that way. Again, I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers, but. I just I've been doing this a long time now and I've seen a lot of collections and. I'll be honest with you. I've walked in to some collections and immediately out of them because I mean, I'm just disgusted at, at the fact that this person told me they loved snakes so much and they care about their snakes so much, you know, and then I go and see their collection and I'm like, damn dude, this is how you're, this is how much you care about your snakes. Dude. I hope you don't ever care about me. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you're going to treat me like this, dude, if this is what yeah. your caring looks like, don't ever care about me. 100%. You know, it's disgusting, yeah. man. Um, on that note, time is getting on. We've taken up a lot of your time. Yes. Um, just a few, a quick question before we let you pop off. So what would your advice be? And I think you've sort of already answered this, but what would your advice be to a brand new Venomous Keeper? Whew. Brand new venomous keeper. Uh, I mean, the, I would say don't let anybody sway your opinion on what you want to do with keeping venomous and what species you want to keep. You know, you, you, you hear the age old question all the time, you know, what is the best starter venomous or what's the easiest venomous to keep? There, there is no starter venomous. There are no starter venomous snakes. You know, because I, in my opinion, you know, they say, okay, maybe copperheads, you know, are the easiest to keep or work with or whatever. If they bite you, they're not so bad. Okay, that's great. That's awesome. Work with a copperhead if that is the species that you're interested in. Right. But, a, but a fucking Osage copperhead isn't going to teach you jack shit about a king cobra if that's what you're interested in keeping. You know what I mean? Okay. So you need to find the species that you're interested in, in keeping. You need to you need to make sure that that's the species that you're interested in keeping. Do your research. Spend time with these animals if you can in other people's collections. You know, put in the hours with the animals. Really get to learn the animals and what they need from you. You know, not what you can give them or how they're gonna what they're gonna do for you, but how you can do for that animal. You know, and you make sure. That when you make a choice and you you finalize and, and get an animal that you're going to keep, make sure that you're giving it exactly, you know, your best. If you're giving it anything less, then you, you just you shouldn't be keeping it at all. Yeah. hundred percent. Wise Sorry. words. Yeah, I guess that's that's it, man. It, you know, that's my biggest thing is 
don't 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 do this stuff too because you you think it's cool or because you want to impress kids at your school or something like that man it's this stuff isn't cool you know there it, it is cool and it, it can it can be very cool you know for the right reasons right you know but the people that are serious about this and take it serious and learning about them seriously and conservation you know i think i think i speak for the the majority of us when i say that we don't appreciate you know the people keeping this stuff and shoving it in their friends faces and using them like little trophies you know it's yeah yeah 100%. That's not what it's about, man. That's not that's not what keeping snakes is about. Well put, man. Well put. So, where can people find the Club King? So, I really just do Instagram now. Um I used to do Facebook quite a bit. Um I couldn't weed out the political posts as much as I wanted to from family and friends without offending a lot of people. Um, so I just kind of fell off of Facebook and now I'm on Instagram. Um, that's, I post a lot of my photos on Instagram. A lot of my stories that I post on there are of, you know, trips that I go on, herping trips and, you know, cool things that have, uh, happened in my snake room, you know, uh, videos of, of my stuff eating lizards and cool, cool little pictures of me and my friends out in the field and stuff like that, you know, just kind of a, a little tag along for some of my, my herp life. You know, yeah, man. it's awesome. We, we love it. It is awesome. I can't recommend it enough. I would urge anybody that's listening to this to check it out. You will not be disappointed. I really appreciate that, guys. I really do, man. I, I put a lot of years of, of hard work and effort in this stuff. So it's kind of cool, you know, that that there are people out there across the world now who, uh, you know, appreciate what I'm doing. Uh, uh, that really means a lot to me. 100%. It's uh, many a very dull, cold, and boring night shift. I check Instagram, and I see some of your stuff. And I'll be honest, part of me goes, for fuck's sake! You know, <laughs> I want to be doing that, but honestly, it is just it is fantastic stuff. It really does cheer me up. It's good stuff. Yeah, I like I said, I, I can't tell you how much that means to me. I mean, I, I, it, I don't want to sound... Uh, you know, self-righteous or anything when I say this, but it's kind of all what I've always wanted out of this. You know, I always wanted to make a voice for, for the species I keep and to, to be the best. I mean, for lack of a better term, you know, I don't do anything in life and, and try to be mediocre at it. You know, sure. nothing do I ever go into and say, man, I'd, I'd like to be second best at that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, I, don't, I don't think you got anything to worry about. I think you're crushing it, mate. So, uh, yeah. Good Again, I, I really appreciate it, and I, I'm glad that I'm glad that you guys appreciate what I'm doing. Yeah, that's cool. It means a lot. Well, this is the Venom Exchange Radio episode two with our first ever guest, the Club King, Mr. Kyle Vargas. So, thank you again for coming on. Uh, we're gonna try and get as many of these podcasts out as possible. Uh, we haven't really picked a date or a time yet. But we promise continuing venomous content is much to the abilities of myself and Nipper. Um, and uh, anything else you want to touch base on, Nip? No, just huge thanks for sparing your time for us. Really appreciate it. I mean, I know we're all busy. You've got a massive collection to uh, <laughs> look after. But it's been an absolute pleasure. I, try, I tried not to be too fangirl. I hope that came across. <laughs> no, yeah. Like I said, it, I, I appreciate you guys, you know, for getting me on. Uh, I mean... Again, it's it's special to me, man, to be a part of stuff like this. So, yeah, I appreciate both much, of you indeed. guys. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. um, hopefully, we're going to kind of do your what's, what's the word? Your opposite number next. I'm going to try and talk to my friend Peter Gibbons and get him to come on, and he has a very similar size to collection from yours, but mainly Asian and European stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with him. Yeah, you know Peter, dear. I don't know. Him I don't know him personally, but I, I I've seen a lot of his stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a good lad. I, I've been to shows and quite shows with him and various other things. His collection, like yours, I love because it's so clean and tidy and well looked after, which is the most important thing. So uh, hopefully that will be the next episode. Awesome. Oh, I look forward to hearing all of them. Grand. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, man. For sure, man. You guys stay in touch. 
Cheers. We'll do. See you later. All right. Have a good one. Cheers. If you're looking to track us down on social media, you can find us at Venom Exchange Radio, as well as at Nipper Reed and at Knobtails.ig. You can also check us out on Morelia Python Radio Network and the Herpetoculture Network on both Instagram and your favorite podcast apps. Feel free to hop on YouTube and check out Venomous Etiquette videos. And don't forget to click like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.